Well, let me describe to you what you would have, would have seen. Uh, I would have introduced you to uh, a psychologist and, and a professor named John Gottman. Uh, he's the man uh, in the video. Uh, and he realized several years ago that he realized that he had problems. He realized he wasn't too good with the ladies. Uh, he didn't know how relationships with women were supposed to work, and his track record of failed relationships showed it. So being a psychologist and being a researcher, he decided to research the problem in order to find a solution. Uh, he devised experiments to figure out what relationship qualities kept men and women together in marriage. He interviewed hundreds, eventually thousands of couples to find out about their relationship. Gottman asked them how they met, what their philosophy of marriage was, what they argued over. He used very sensitive uh, measuring equipment to measure facial cues and heart rates and other physiological cues. Then he tracked the couples for many years, observing which couples stayed together and which couples got divorced. And based on his observations, Gottman developed a model which could predict with 90% certainty whether a couple would get divorced or not. Now, Gottman's model has been subject to much scrutiny, but his research and his observations are nonetheless interesting. And among his findings is what you would have seen in that video. Uh, when married couples are at least five times as positive with each other as they are negative with each other, they tend to stay married. When they're not five times as positive as they are negative, they tend to get divorced. So it's okay to be critical as long as you have five positive things to say afterwards. Just write them down, keep them in your pocket, ready to go when something negative accidentally slips out. Just keep them right there, ready to go. But another of Gottman's findings is this. After collecting his data, the psychologist identified four attitudes that are most predictive of divorce. He calls these attitudes the four horsemen of the apocalypse because they signal the end. When one or more of these attitudes are present in any significance, chances of divorce skyrocket. The four horsemen of the marriage apocalypse are these, criticalness, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. We all know what criticalness is. It's endlessly picking at the personality and the choices of your spouse. Defensiveness is or contempt, rather, is disregarding, insulting your spouse and his or her opinions. Uh, defensiveness is justifying your own mistakes without taking responsibility. Anybody know what defensiveness is? Yeah, right, absolutely. <laughs> Not me, <laughs> maybe you. And stonewalling, stonewalling is separating yourself emotionally from your spouse instead of engaging your spouse to work out your problems. These are all poison pills in a marriage. They can be a harbinger of the end times. They need to be acknowledged and addressed by both partners if your marriage has any chance. Now, while each of these attitudes is deadly, Dr. Gottman also identified the one attitude that is most likely to predict di divorce. Of these four, criticalness, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling, which do you think is the most predictive of a broken marriage? I think Hudson said it. Contempt. People who hate each other <laughs> tend not to stay married. Spouses hate each other. They tend not to stay married. Spouses who insult each other, spouses who roll their eyes at each other. Have you ever had someone roll your eyes? That makes you feel loved and appreciated and accepted. Spouses who can't listen to each other's opinions, treat each other as worthless housemates. These couples tend not to last, statistically. Now, whether or not we agree with Gottman's model of divorce, it's hard to disagree with this conclusion that couples who hate each other oftentimes don't stay married. You can't build a happy relationship on contempt. Happy marriage takes something else. Not defensiveness, but humility. Not criticalness, but encouragement. Not stonewalling, but engagement. And not contempt, but respect. Talked about love last week. You weren't here. That's all right. Did you listen to it? Got YouTube, got CDs? Okay, all right. Respect <laughs> is the opposite of contempt. Happy marriages just take respect. And that's what I want to talk about with you this morning. Uh, building a marriage based on respect. If you're just joining us for the first week of the series, maybe, uh, we're talking this morning about marriage, sacred marriage. Uh, the series is called How God Designed Marriage to Make People Holy, Not Happy. And the premise of the series is just that, uh, that marriage is a wonderful thing. 
not just because it can bring love and joy into the lives of two people. I mean, that's great about marriage. But what's even greater about marriage is the pain and the difficulty it brings, the struggles and the drama. This is how people change and grow, by learning to endure and grow through the struggles of being married. It's, it's the difficulties of marriage that turn us more into the image of Christ and get us more ready for heaven. This is a good thing. It's the difficulties of marriage that teach people about love. It's the difficulties of marriage that teach people about per- perseverance. It's the difficulties of marriage that teach people about servanthood and prayer. And it's the difficulties of marriage that teach people about respect. Now, the Bible is very clear on the importance of respect in every type of relationship. As early as the book of Leviticus, young folks were told to rise in respect of the aged. They were also to respect your father and mother. Slaves were told to obey your masters with respect and fear. Paul tells the church in Thessalonica that they are to respect those who work hard among you, respect your church leaders. But the command to respect isn't just given to children towards parents or slaves or the youthful toward the aged. Peter writes, show proper respect to who? Everyone. Paul writes in Romans, be eager to respect one another. Respect should be the general climate of all our relationships inside and outside the church. This obviously also includes marriage. Paul writes in Ephesians that the wife must respect her husband. And Peter reverses the commands and tells husbands to be considerate with your wives, treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Don't get tripped up by that weaker partner stuff. Don't get unnecessarily offended by that. I mean, Michelle will be the first to tell you, you know, I can out bench press her any day, beat her in arm wrestling. So Christian relationships, certainly Christian marriages, must be known by their respect. Respect is a sign that we value others, have a proper understanding of ourselves and our standing and relationship to them. But this raises two questions about respect. First of all, what is it? What is respect? It's a word we throw around a lot, but do we even know what it means? What does it mean to respect somebody? Do we respect a spouse the same way we respect the government? I was taught in school to respect the earth. My dad taught me to respect power tools. The Bible tells me to respect people. Do I respect the earth, power tools, and people the same way? Do we respect ourselves in the same way we respect others? Does respect mean admiration or fear? When Rodney Dangerfield, you old-timers remember Rodney Dangerfield, what did he complain about not getting? What exactly was he not getting? Yeah, what does that mean? No laughs. Uh, Equal treatment for comedians. Also, and this is a biggie, how do you respect someone that isn't that respectable? How do you respect someone who's just not a very respectable person? I mean, Paul, in the New Testament, Paul tells slaves to respect their masters. Really? They're being enslaved by these guys. Respect them? So that's the first question. What does it mean to respect? But secondly, how do you learn it? How do you learn respect? I tell the kids on the teams I coach all the time that they need to learn to respect authority, respect each other. I might not be able to tell them a thing about basketball, but I can teach them respect, or at least I think I can. Then I watch, however, as they ignore what I tell them, roll their eyes at me, and then say mean things to me and each other. My school, my kid's school, tries to do character education and respect is one of their key concepts. A while back, they had Respect Month. Anybody else at school have Respect Month? They had Respect Month. They sent home announcements about Respect Month. They did Respect Curriculum, put signs up around the school about respect, put it on the big sign outside. February is Respect Month. Well, that's probably a good thing. February didn't get a lot of respect among all the months. It's only 28 days, not a lot of federal holidays to speak of. So... So the school was trying to teach respect, but I get reports from the kids about how respect month was going. Not well from my view. Principal's office was still full. Kids still broke the rules, forgot their homework, called each other names. Similarly, this morning, I am getting ready to teach you a lot of wonderful things about what it means to respect each other. Does that mean you will? How would you learn it? How will we really learn to respect one another? And I can't understate the importance of this question either. Learning how to respect isn't just an essential part of a marriage relationship or relationships in general. It's part of relating to God. P- 
people who don't respect others won't respect the God who made them. And you can't get into heaven unless you respect God. There's a story in the Gospels uh, that Jesus tells uh, to an audience. And he tells the story about God the Father sending prophets and teachers to the people to get them to repent of their sins and love each other. One by one, though, the people ignore the prophets and they kill them. And finally, the father decides to send his son. And he says outright, he says, they're going to respect my son. But that doesn't work either. And the people kill the son. And the father finally reaches his limit and comes down to earth and destroys all those who don't respect his prophets and his son. That's how the story ends. They all die. That's where our disrespect will take us. So it's not just for the sake of marriage that respect needs to be learned. We can't please God or get into heaven unless we learn to respect each other and certainly our spouses. Again, though, how do we learn that? For arrogant, selfish children like ourselves, how do we learn respect? That's a hard question to answer. But I will tell you, marriage gives people a pretty good shot. Like Dr. Gottman observes, marriages that are filled with contempt, not respect, tend not to last. And if you don't learn to respect each other, you get divorced or you live in misery. So marriage challenges people to make a daily choice as to whether or not they're going to respect their spouse. If you don't, you'll suffer the consequences. If you do, you'll reap the rewards. It's hard to learn respect, but marriage at least gives people a pretty good shot at it. We're still left with a pretty important question, though. What does it mean? What does it mean to respect? It's one of those words that gets thrown around a lot, but what does it really mean? I spent a lot of time this week researching and thinking about that word and found it's a pretty hard word to pin down. Entire dissertations have been written about the word and the concept of respect and the precise meaning. In general, the word respect means to treat other people with dignity as equal persons. But even that's a big idea, and it's hard to pin down specifically. Within the larger concept of respect, though, there are some more specific meanings of respect that I think it might be helpful to talk about, to flesh out. Talking about some more specific meanings of respect might help us understand what respect looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's what I want to do this morning. I want to talk about three more specific meanings of the word respect. And because this is a marriage series, I'm going to be talking about it within the context of marriage. But that doesn't mean this doesn't apply to each and every single relationship we have with other people and certainly with God. So I have three shades of meaning this morning that I want to talk about with respect, the word respect. And this, this uh, message this morning is going to be brought to you by the letter R. To respect means to recognize... To respect means to repute, and to respect means to revere. To recognize, to repute, and to revere. And I'm really excited about each one of those words. You know, usually when you get three point, they all start with the same letter. One of them is like, eh. I think all these three are very well chosen. So let's start at the top. To respect means to recognize. To recognize means the, to acknowledge the legitimacy of, to consider worthy of your attention. They use this in Congress, right? Is anybody sitting around watching C-SPAN in Congress? I recognize the senator from Missouri. The senator from the Missouri has every right to be speaking right now regardless of whatever's going to come out of his mouth. Or government officials talk about recognizing the governments of other nations. We do not officially recognize the government of Palestine. We do not officially recognize the government of Syria, etc. So to recognize someone means to respect them by acknowledging their rights, their existence, their needs, their fears, and their desires. This is actually where the word respect comes from. The word respect comes from an old Latin word meaning to see, uh, which is also where we get the word spectacle. Respect. Get it? Hear it? Spectacle. Spectacular. Something to see. So to respect someone is to notice them, to see them, to recognize them. Plenty of spouses don't always feel recognized, though. They don't feel noticed. Far from being recognized, they feel ignored or invisible. Hello, I'm over here. I have needs. Jesus had a way of respecting people by recognizing them, by, treat, by acknowledging they were there, uh, maybe you know the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Know the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. In the story, Jesus was by himself at a well in Samaria. It was the middle of the day. 
woman shows up to get water. Jesus addresses her and asks for a drink. He then chats her up a bit. The woman is startled. Culturally speaking, this conversation shouldn't be happening. First of all, she's a woman. Back in the first century, men and women, no fraternizing. Uh, secondly, she's a Samaritan. What was Jesus? A Jew. Were Samaritans and Jews friends? No. Uh, thirdly, she was disreputable. She had been married five times, was living with a man who was not her husband. Rat, uh, rabbis don't fraternize with disreputable Samaritan women. It would be like me hanging out in secret with a sexy Muslim prostitute. I'm relating the story <laughs> so that you understand the drama of what's going on here. I don't do that. Should I? I don't know. My point is Jesus had all sorts of reasons to ignore her, but he didn't ignore her. He recognized her as worthy of his attention. He risked his own reputation to talk to her about God. He recognized her need, not just for water, but for salvation. This is what it means to respect, to recognize someone's needs and someone's rights, to acknowledge them as a full and complete person. My wife, Michelle, and I have had to learn a lot about respect in this respect that each of us has as much right to be in this relationship as the other person does. We see this in how we handle our differences, recognizing the importance of being as different as we are. When we got married over 15 years ago, I had no idea how different we were. When you get married, you're just kind of in love. After a while, you have to come to terms with just how different you are from the other, and that if your spouse is not sinning against you, there's nothing wrong with your differences. It has taken me 15 years, for example, to realize that clutter is not sin. <laughs> Say it with me. Clutter is not sin. If you don't get anything else out of this message aside from Jesus being Lord, <laughs> clutter is not sin. There is nothing sinful about clutter. I did not grow up cluttered. Everything in my house had its place. Everything in my house got put in its place. In fact, the, the two most important women in my life right now are very different, but they're sitting like re right <laughs> close to each other. Right? Clutter, non-clutter. There they are, right over there. <laughs> Everything in my house had its place. Everything in my house got put in its place. In Michelle's house growing up, things had lots of places. They were nomad things. <laughs> sometimes those things were here, sometimes those things were here. Uh, the things like to move around. Cups didn't need to be in the cabinet. They could hang out wherever they wanted. <laughs> by the toaster, by the TV, by the plates that didn't need to get put away either. It was a free range home, if you know what a free range home is. Things were made to wander, to explore the land. I call that clutter, she calls it freedom. Okay. <laughs> There is nothing sinful about this. I was kind of hoping there was. <laughs> I researched. You know how the Bible says that cleanliness is next to godliness? It doesn't. <laughs> the Bible doesn't actually say that. If the Bible did say that, it'd be a different matter, but it doesn't. She has as much right to live as she lived, as I do, as I live. The challenge of marriage is making enough compromises so you can do it together happily. But I'm not just talking about clutter or cleaning. I'm talking about communication styles. I'm talking about emotions. As much as my wife has the right to not fold up blankets after using them on the couch, she also has the right to feel whatever she's feeling. She has the right to say what she wants to say. I do too. And as we've learned to recognize, recognize each other and engage each other at the well instead of ignoring each other, we've learned how to communicate better. We spend less time arguing, more time discussing. We learn, we spend less time trying to convey our point and more time trying to understand the other's point. So sure, you might be married, but do you recognize your spouse as an equal partner in your relationship? Do you recognize the legitimacy of her desires and wants? If they're not wrong or unbiblical, what's the problem exactly, other than yourself? Do you recognize his struggles and fears? Do you recognize each other's feelings and emotions? 
To respect means to recognize. Secondly, uh, to respect means to repute. Uh, to repute means, to repute someone means to think of them highly, and usually publicly. Uh, a, a reputation, you know, a reputation is. What's what people think about somebody else. Uh, and a reputation of what people think of someone, and to respect a person uh, means to burnish their reputation. Now, in general, Christians should speak well of each other uh, and enhance, not harm, their reputations. To speak ill of others is considered what? To speak ill of others is considered slander. That's why James writes in the New Testament, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law. And Proverbs says, He who covers an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, those words are hard to abide, especially in marriage. Uh, When marriage gets difficult, it's easy to vent and to feel okay about it. Several years ago, uh, when I was working as a pastor in Texas, uh, I was involved in a men's Bible study, and one of the guys was struggling in his marriage, and he had another fight with his wife, and he came to Bible study in a very foul mood. And he needed to get some stuff off his chest, so he just let her have it. I mean, she wasn't there. It was a men's Bible study. But you, you can imagine how it was going. She's always doing this. She's always doing that. I can't stand this. I can't stand that. He would just keep on saying. And what, what's remarkable, I mean, that's not surprising. Guys do that all the time. What was remarkable uh, is that we were all listening empathetically, even drawing it out. Tell us more. We understand. Wow, that's terrible. I'm sorry you had to marry this terrible person. It felt so okay to do. Even as Christians, we're supposed to be honest, right? We're supposed to take our problems to God in community, right? Well, not like that. In fact, in the middle of this guy's tirade, one of the more mature men in the group, the one with the healthiest marriage, told him to stop. Just stop. You're making, I remember the moment, You're making your wife look terrible. Which is true. I mean, we all thought worse of his wife without even realizing it. Sure, he needed help. This was not the way to do it and probably only helped widen the gulf between he and his spouse and between her and and their community. No spouse deserves to be reamed without being present or even while being present. Similarly, I, I... Never know what to do when I'm hanging out with my normal unchurched friends and they start making wife commentary or marriage jokes. Know what I mean? Does everybody find, anybody find yourself in this situation? Uh, they start complaining about wives, the nagging, the spending, the moodiness, and then they turn to me and say, isn't that how it is, Matt? Isn't marriage a, 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 a botch? <laughs> we'll flip the vowels. Uh, first of all, you know, when, when we get into that, I don't, are we joking? I don't know if we're joking. I mean, do you have a problem that we should talk about? I don't know. Uh, besides which, you know, I know this is not funny, but I like being married. <laughs> I love my wife. She's a beautiful person. I mean, if we're going to joke about something, maybe we could joke about your problems instead. Always works for me. Why make fun of others when they're not there, when you can make fun of yourself without going behind your back? It's rude, but at least it's not gossip. (laughs) Of course, to turn the tables here a little bit, don't feel like you're off the hook here, women. Uh, Husbands aren't the only ones who complain about their spouses. I've watched your movies. (laughs) I've read your magazines. I know uh, what goes on at those slumber parties. Uh, My wife gossips to me about what you guys gossip about. (laughs) I'm kidding, she doesn't really. My point here is that if we need help loving our spouse, tarnishing their reputations is not the way to do it. The opposite is true. Protecting their reputations, celebrating them publicly, respecting them publicly. I mean, remember what Dr. Gottman would have said in the video that you might have watched, that in order to stay happily married, what do you got to say? Five positive things about your spouse to to every critical comment. Uh, I have absolutely no data to back this up, but it's a theory. But I would say that one public positive comment 
about your spouse is worth at least three private positive comments. So for every critical comment, you can see either five private positive comments or one public positive comment and two private positive comments. By the way, did not the female vocalist we had this morning do a fantastic job? <laughs> Didn't she sound like an angel from heaven? <laughs> Are you so blessed to have her in your lives? Are you so blessed to have her in your lives? Doesn't she radiate beauty and friendliness? Would we probably not even exist as a church without her? That's really not funny. It's very, very true. Five, so 15. I've got lots of, this is called banking. It's called, <laughs> this will get me, I make a lot of withdrawals. <laughs> this will get me through Tuesday with all the negative, stupid stuff that comes out of my mouth. It'll get me through Tuesday. To respect means to recognize, to repute, and lastly, to respect means to revere. Uh, you know what it means to revere. It means to think highly of someone to the point of awe and fear. It means to honor as worthy. The word respect uh, is used this way in the Bible as a synonym for honor and fear. Uh, Paul tells the Romans, for example, give everyone what you owe them. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. He tells slaves to obey your masters with respect and fear. And as you remember what Peter tells husbands, I'm sure you remember what Peter tells husbands, treat your wives with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. So the idea here is to recognize another person's true value and to treat them accordingly. Notice what Peter says. He does not say respect your wives. He says respect your wives as heirs of the gracious gift of life. And that's what she is. She's not just a spouse. She's not just a partner. She's an heiress of heaven. Your husband is not just a breadwinner or a fix-it guy or your last best option. He's a child of God called to rule the, to rule the universe with Christ. I was thinking about this the past couple weeks as Great Britain was celebrating the 60th anniversary of Queen Elizabeth's rule on the throne. Are you aware of this, if you have been paying attention at all? Uh, I think, is this the silver diamond? diamond? Oh, thank you. You've been following closely. What was silver was what? Okay, but it's diamond. Okay, diamond jubilee. Uh, but even people opposed to the monarchy will admit that her reign, Elizabeth's reign, has been remarkable. Sure, Great Britain is smaller than it used to be. It's easier to govern. She does have parliament now and lots of actually democratically elected politicians to run the place. Plus, unlike the previous Elizabeth, she's not constantly fending off France or Spain. But despite that, Elizabeth has been a faithful servant. She gave up any, at birth, any claim to normalcy, served her country with perseverance, decorum. She's made very few missteps, remains one of the most highly regarded celebrities in the world, uh, in a world of short-lived celebrity based on outlandish behavior. It's actually kind of refreshing to see such a steady, dramaless public servant who does not care how big her glasses are. For all these reasons, the people of Great Britain really do respect her. They admire her. They invoke her name. They bow when she enters a room. They stop to let her speak. They pray for her. They have already spent $15.8 billion <laughs> celebrating her time on the throne during this party. That's impressive. She probably deserves all the respect she's getting. But I can't help noticing the contrast I am married to a woman far more royal than the Queen of England. <laughs> Elizabeth has ruled for 60 years. With Christ, my wife will rule over creation for eternity. Elizabeth always seems to have the perfect outfit on. My wife is covered by the glorious robes of Christ which cover every blemish and cover even her ugly yellow sweatpants. 
Elizabeth can dissolve parliament and fire a prime minister. My wife is a saint who will judge the world. Elizabeth can call on legions of advisors to counsel her. My wife can call upon God for his counsel and has the support of his angels. My wife is more than a queen. She's a daughter of God. My account here is just... (laughs) (laughs) I forget this. We all do, in our frumpy clothes and ordinary bodies and mistake-riddled lives. We forget who we are as heirs of salvation. We forget who we're married to. We forget who we're sitting next to. We forget who we're sleeping next to. We think we're ordinary, normal, nothing much to speak of, but we're more than that. Because of Christ, we are royal heirs of salvation. How would you treat your spouse if you actually believed that? How would you speak to them? How would you serve them? How would you address them? How would you protect their reputation? Would you open the car door for them? Would you give them every chance to speak? Would you celebrate their every day on the throne? If you're a follower of Christ, that's who you are. You are a royal child of God. No matter how disrespectable your life is, because of Christ, you are worthy of respect, honor, and admiration. Not because of a single thing you've done, but because of everything he's done for you. And because of Jesus, so is your spouse, as royal as you are. So is your brother and sister sitting next to you on the throne this morning. We are royalty in Christ. Let's respect each other as such. And let's pray.